Hello, my name is Greg Massey, and this is episode number 37 of The Color of Air, a podcast about the musical journey. You can find us on the web at colorofair.com. We're on Twitter, at The Color of Air. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash colorofairpodcast. And you can email us at any time at colorofairpodcast at gmail.com. So it's been a while. It's been close to a year, I think, since I released my last episode um, with Steph Sparrow. And a lot has been going on. And the first thing to mention is that I am going to be the only guest on this week's episode. This is just going to be more of a a fun episode to clue you in on some of the stuff that I've been up to. Um, And the first thing that's really important because it just happened today, the day that I'm recording this, I have launched a new website. And if you remember from past episodes, uh, when I do my plugs at the beginning, you know, I plug all the website for Color of Air and I would, would, uh, you know, talk about the the Bandcamp site for where you can get Ballaset material, um, the Bandcamp where you could get um, Concilium material. And I have all these various things that have just been, you know, there's a Patreon and it's like there's so many weird little websites here and there. And you can't see me right now, but I'm kind of making a hand motion to talk about how there's just all these different links swimming around me with all these different projects. And a lot of them, you know, have gotten um, busier this year. And I've added some new ones, um, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. But... It's important for me to talk about retconindustries.com. That is my new website, retconindustries.com. As you know, I've been releasing music as retcon recordings for almost uh, 11 years now. And I wanted to expand it because more than just the Battle Set albums and EPs, more than the Color of Air podcast, Retcon is just kind of growing into a multifaceted, and I hate using that word because it sounds so businesslike, but it's kind of just, it's grown. And I've got, you know, the band camp for, um, for Ballaset. I've got the band camp for Concilium. I've got the podcast. I've got a Patreon. Uh, there's a blog that I want to get started. And that's just the tip of the iceberg here. And so trying to give you seven different URLs to look into in your spare time seemed like pretty annoying and it seemed as if it wouldn't be the best way to promote what's going on with me. So I decided to consolidate everything into one single website, retconindustries.com. There you're going to find I have a complete discography including samples of pretty much every record I've played on or at least links to Bandcamp sites for every record I've played on for the last 17 years. That includes Maldon Lowell, Kodot, Balaset, Concilium, as well as my, you know, a lot of the different guest solo appearances that I did for NR and Lauren Flaherty and Nick Hudson and Marin. There's just, you know, it's it's got the entire Greg Massey discography there for you to explore if you want to. Also, it's going to have a direct link to a much nicer looking website uh, for the podcast. And if you go to colorofair.com, it's just going to default you to the retcon, uh, retcon Industries slash podcast tab, which is fine. Either way will work just fine. Um, but it's going to be a little bit more intuitive. It's going to look a little nicer than the normal, the kind of uh, plain looking libsyn general one that i've been using since i started the podcast basically i wanted it to look more professional you know i I wouldn't call myself a professional podcaster but i wanted to give off the image that i am one and um, so that was important to me uh also i plan on doing some video content i've been talking about doing that for years and i'm you know gonna try to get that going in the next year I've got a blog that I'm interested in in doing with some of my musical thoughts. And so all the links to everything 
is on retconindustries.com. So this is that's the first part of this podcast is to promote that. And the second part is to promote probably what has become the biggest thing in my life creatively this year. And that's capital wrestling. And I think I've mentioned on previous podcasts that wrestling, professional wrestling, is a huge interest of mine. You know, I grew up with it. I grew up in the 80s with Hulk Hogan. Um, When I went to college in the late 90s, you know, I, you know, rediscovered it with, you know, Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock and all that other stuff. My favorite wrestler is The Undertaker. Um, Wrestling is just, you know, at various points in my life has been a really big deal for me. And there's been times when I haven't really been into it, but I've really gotten back into it as of 2014. So I've really, you know, been watching more and been trying to, you know, keep up with it. And along the way, you know, one of the things as a musician that I always noticed was the theme music that different wrestlers had when they would come in. And in WWE or WWF, they always had one guy who was doing it. His name was Jim Johnston. And that's changed now. Now they have um, a different group who's doing them called uh, CFOS or C- CFO with the dollar sign at the end. And But what attracted me to that is that it's you have a company who's trying to brand itself sonically um, with music, uh, with music for wrestlers, music for programs, things like that. And it's not just one style of music, you know, the, the, the guys for who wrote the music have to be fluent in a lot of different styles and be able to pull off rock or reggae or pop music or dance music or any number of different things. And so as a musician, it's a really interesting thing. And, you know, I was always interested in it. And... When I really started to get back into wrestling, I was kind of thinking, well, you know what would be cool? I could probably record, write and record theme music for wrestlers. It seems like something that I could do because there's no way I'm getting in a ring at, you know, 39 years old and I'm going to learn how to take bumps and, uh, you know, try to become a world champion somewhere. But it's, it's, it's a way that I wanted to get involved with the wrestling business. I wanted to learn about the wrestling business. Um, I've been listening to wrestling podcasts a lot. And the wrestling business really interests me. It's, it's something that, you know, I've watched since I was a kid, you know, from the time when I believed it was real to when I was the cynical, typical, you know, I know everything wrestling guy, you know, this is all fake, blah, 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 blah to the way I am now where I, I see it as a you know a, a cool form of entertainment and and I like stories um, and it's it's about telling stories and it's about entertaining and it's all stuff that I'm really into so it was just kind of a no-brainer that I'd want to get involved with the with the wrestling business but there was really not a way to do it you know I kind of put some feelers out there um, to email people to see if there is such a thing as an independent wrestling music guy and didn't really get anywhere. So I just kind of put it on the shelf. In January of this year, uh, my old college roommate, Marcus Dowling, and his partner, Matt Ryan, um, launched Capital Wrestling. And I saw it on Facebook that they were promoting it. And I was... At first, I was like, okay, Marcus is running a wrestling show. In my mind, when I see somebody talking about an independent wrestling show, I just kind of assume, oh, it's probably going to be something that's in a high school gymnasium or something like that. You know, just the, the way people kind of associate indie wrestling. But I figured, well, you know, let me just contact them and see what's up. So I emailed Marcus, or texted him, I think, and I just said... Hey, saw you doing wrestling. Do you need any music? And his response was an emphatic yes. And immediately I'm talking with Matt, uh, the other guy, the other uh, co-founder, and we're talking about um, writing a theme song for the company, excuse me, for the company as a whole. Um, We're talking about wrestlers that are going to need music. And all of a sudden it went from, a casual question to my old college roommate to 
wow, I've got some work to do. And, uh, excuse me, I'm very thirsty. So it became this much bigger thing immediately. And I still had no real idea of what was going on with it. What, what, you know, what the general plan was. And, um, it, it became something a lot bigger. And when I talked with Marcus and Matt and saw the vision that they want for it, that they didn't want to just be your normal indie wrestling company. They wanted to do something that makes a mark that gets attention. That's original, um, while still paying homage to the wrestling of the past. You know, that's kind of their, uh, kind of the thing that started them on this. And, um, so I immediately just got wrapped up into this world. Um, it's, it's, it's been a kind of a whirlwind time for me. And I think 2017 has probably gone by fast for a lot of people, but to me from January to now in the beginning of October, it's flown by. Capital Wrestling has done three live shows, which have become TV tapings. So we've put out, um, I don't even know how many episodes at this point. Um, we've been getting better at it and better. And as I talk to you now, I'm on pretty much on track to have 18 themes, original themes done um, probably by the end of this year, maybe 20. So take a step back from that for a second to think about that. I have been probably the most, the worst at procrastinating from doing music. I still have battle set recordings from that we started in 2010, 2011, 2012 that I haven't finished yet. Concilium has been working on original music for a while. Not necessarily that I'm the only one to blame for that, but you know, it's I've got a, I've had a ton of music ideas the last couple of years which have kind of just gone to the back burner because I just was having a real problem finishing anything. So last summer, before all this Capital Wrestling stuff started. I, um, excuse me, I upgraded my home studio with the purpose of trying to motivate, so excuse me, motivate myself to get better. So that was kind of a big thing for me. And when this capital wrestling thing happened, it just, you know, it inspired me and it got me motivated to get better at what I do. Because when I'm writing theme music, I don't have a backing band that I can call to, you know, session musicians to come in and play it. I don't have a mixer or a mastering guy on that I can send these tracks to. I'm on my own here. And most of that is just because there's such a limited budget. Well, you know, zero dollar budget, basically. And I have to make use of the limitations that I have and make the best product possible. And given my limitations, I feel like I've done a really great job. I've gotten a really good response to the themes that I've done. Um, you know, we've been releasing them. They're for sale. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's just been probably one of the most creatively fulfilling things I've, I've done. And like I said, you know, I've always wanted to learn about the wrestling business. Well, I just kind of got thrown in because every time... Uh, Capital does TV taping. I'm there helping to set up the audio equipment, running the live audio, you know, cueing wrestlers' entrances, entrances and exits. Um, you know, working with um, Steve, one of the announcers, um, who's also kind of a, one of the audio guys. You know, getting the process even smoother. You know, we're kind of a bare knuckles crew. You know, we're, we don't have a million audio and video guys like WWE or even some of the bigger name independent wrestling federations. We're just kind of this motley crew of people who have a passion for what we're doing to make the best product possible. And we're all dealing with limitations that we have. And so far we have just been really doing great. And, you know, I, I say this as both a fan of wrestling and just because I'm involved in the company and the people that I work with are amazing. From the wrestlers to the, like I said, to the the announcers, to the refs, to the wrestlers, to Marcus and Matt, who are the head of it all, to the interns, to, you know, everything. Everything's been really sweet. 
And everybody has been busting their ass to make a kick-ass wrestling product. And, um, you know, I know this is starting to sound like a commercial pitch here, but um, what I wanted to do, let me get away from, you know, stroking the ego of my fellow Capital Wrestling employees. What I wanted to do is introduce you to the world of Capital Wrestling through the music of Capital Wrestling, because that's the one thing I can talk to you about. And I wanted, because the theme songs are a little shorter than than some other songs I've been involved with, I'm going to play a whole smattering of songs, and I'm going to talk to you about the creative process that went into each song. So even if you're not a wrestling fan, you can hopefully get something out of the information that I talk about with how I created certain things and certain songs. And, um, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, you kind of enjoy it. Excuse me while I'm writing, while I talk too. Um, so this might be a little bit long, but it's going to be not as much talking from me and more about the music. So to start off, we should probably start at the beginning. And that is going to be the capital theme song and what went into this song was uh marcus and matt telling me that they wanted to get a vibe that was similar to nwa wrestling from the 1980s in terms of the theme song and the nwa you know the themes i was listening to are very synthesizer based based on the time frame you know the early 80s 82 83 um, a lot of it reminded me a lot of like giorgio Moroder with the midnight express soundtrack <clears throat> so I wanted to do a throwback theme and um, you know and at the same time it gave me a chance to learn about the different synthesizers that I had access to with my new software and um, you know it just it was a it was a chance for me to take a simple melody which I just kind of plunked out on my guitar when I was on the couch one day and I said you know what this sounds like a simple enough but catchy enough melody that you could, you know, you put um, kind of a, a nice little driving synthy beat behind it. You know, you've got theme music material. And um, Marcus and Matt really enjoyed it and loved it. And this was the theme that pretty much got me my job. Because it, after I said this to them, I was made the official composer of Capital Wrestling. So here in all of its glory is the Capital Wrestling theme.
right. I hope you enjoyed that. So that was the Capital Wrestling theme. And after that kind of got there um, and I got approval on it, then it became about trying to find themes that worked for each individual character. And I was given some wrestlers and, you know, Marcus and Matt gave me links to some of the other interviews they'd done, uh, some of their matches, so I could really kind of understand their character. But at the same time, the character that they, that they were kind of portraying in other federations uh, was probably going to be tweaked a little bit for um, what Capital wanted them to do. So the next one I'm going to play for you is one that is pretty, I'm extremely proud of. And this was the first one where I kind of realized that I had kind of a, you know, kind of a calling for this kind of work. And uh, that was for a wrestler named Colossal Mike Law. And the way Colossal Mike Law was presented to me was that he was the intergender champion of the known universe. And uh, that has since kind of changed in the scope of capital. But at the time, he was we were kind of talking about him being um, a heel or bad guy. And the idea is he was going to be this champion of the known universe, but would never defend his title. <laughs> Which immediately made me laugh, as you can tell. Because uh, there's one thing I really love in professional wrestling. I love cowardly heels and I like because usually they're usually good at, at being very funny and I find that I find that all very entertaining so I immediately gravitated towards this and so I had this grand vision in my head um, where I envisioned a field and this is the exact thing I told to Matt and Marcus at the time too I envisioned this grand field you know empty quiet night, starry night, and out of the corner of your eye, you see this asteroid falling to the earth. And you, the quiet night is disturbed by this loud explosion. And you go and you go to investigate what's there. And you get up close to the crater and you feel kind of scared. And then you peer into the crater and there standing is Colossal Mike Law, champion of the known universe. And that immediately just set my creative mind on fire, really. So I, again, took my guitar and my immediate thing was I thought, okay, Lord of the Rings, <laughs> you know, something epic. I wanted to do something bigger than than just kind of getting them like a you know a guitar riff with some drums um i wanted something special like even more special for him so i created this very simplest simplistic kind of almost power metal instrumental but like kind of a slow slower instrumental not like speed metal and i said you know this needs orchestration so I went about, and it, I can't tell you, begin to tell you how long it took me, hours upon hours, probably five hours total, I'd say, to craft a string arrangement for Mike Law's music that would, um, you know, emphasize the epicness of it and kind of just give this unique feel, this presentation. You know, I want these wrestlers, when they come out to my music, I want them to feel like rock stars. I want them to feel larger than life. I want them to feel, when they're coming out of, of you know, from the back, I want them to feel like they're walking into WrestleMania. That is my goal. And I may not always have the right equipment to make music that suits that but i'm gonna try you know so for mike law putting in the effort creating a um a really dense string arrangement was probably one of the hardest things i've ever done but it taught me a lot about working with virtual instruments in my software it taught me a lot about 
MIDI. It taught me a lot about arranging, orchestration, you know, making sure certain melodies came out at certain points. And it's probably one of the themes I'm most proud of because it just, it pushed me beyond the limits of what I was normally able to do. And so here it is for you right now. This is the theme song for Colossal Mike Law. All right, so that was Colossal Mike Laws. Now, I don't want to dilly-dally. Let's uh, move on to another theme. This one um, was another one which, which kind of came to me quickly, but just was super fun and super awesome to make. This is the theme I wrote for The Pain Train, Preston Quinn. And it was presented to me as kind of a no-nonsense uh, Arn Anderson, for those of you in the wrestling know, uh, type of wrestler, kind of, you know, very steeped in kind of the 70s and 80s style of professional wrestling, you know, bruiser, ass kicker. And um, so one thing that kind of jumped out at me was that in the in the late 80s, early 90s, there was a, um, a character in the WWF called The Earthquake. And his music, which I don't really remember from the time, but when I've revisited it, it was like this simple um, bass drum, snare drum, like. (laughs) 
kind of vibe. It's like this impending doom kind of feel to it. It's just this driving beat with the sound of earthquakes on it. So that was the beat I wanted. But I wanted it to be a little bit different. I wanted to, to change it up a little bit. So what I did was I was just, again, playing on the guitar. And I just came up with this kind of bluesy, bluesy rock lick. And it just I just was... I just knew it. I was like, okay, this is the pain train. And when you set it to that that pulsing beat, and, you know, I added in some sounds of the train, you know, coming. It's like this oncoming destruction, which you can't avoid. And to me, that kind of typified what the pain train of Preston Quinn is all about. So... Here, in all of its glory, is the theme song for the pain train, Preston Quinn. Just as a side note, it was really nice to me at the first Capitol event when I actually got to meet the pain train in person. And he was very complimentary to me of the theme song I made for him. And he had mentioned that in 23 years of doing wrestling, nobody had ever made a theme for him. 
And, you know, that's, that's kind of cool that I was able to make an impact immediately in the wrestling business, um, even on such a small level and just, you know, make, do something for a, a wrestler to help make their, you know, the show that they put on for the people even better. I'm not there to be the star of the show. I'm just, you know, the you know the uh, the dressing really. They're the they're the stars. They're the ones who you know perform at a super high level, entertaining the crowd. And my job is to help them do that. Which leads me to my next theme. <laughs> And I laugh because this is probably my goofiest theme ever. This one is for uh, Logan Easton LaRoe, who is the champion of the 1% and is billed as coming from a gated community inside of another gated community, surrounded by another gated community in Stamford, Connecticut. He is your posh, preppy boy, uh, bad guy heel. Um, and when I asked, okay, well, what's his vibe? What should I be going for? Immediately, um, they came back with Yacht Rock. <laughs> and I'm not an expert on Yacht Rock. I know it's kind of made a resurgence, um, or, you know, it's been kind of a buzzword for people in the last few years. Um, so I wasn't sure where to start. But what I did know was, you know, the other song that I believe was Matt recommended to me was the song Baker Street by uh, Jerry Rafferty. And if you don't know the song Baker Street, you know the saxophone um, part in it. Because in lieu of an actual chorus, they just have this um, driving guitar with this saxophone melody over it. da 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 do da 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 you know that badly sung by me but you know i'm sure just even though it was not in tune you probably know what song i'm talking about you've probably heard it or at least you've heard that saxophone line somewhere so the problem is and this goes back to dealing with limitations i don't know any sax players that i could invite over and basically play on a song for me for free you know, if I'm going to have session musicians come in on these tracks, I'm going to pay them. Or at least I'm going to discuss what's going on with them and, and, and find a way to, you know, compensate them at some point. I'm not just going to expect everybody's going to come into to my home studio and record on these tracks for free for me. Um, so that's where I discovered an app on my phone and uh, my iPad called the sensual sax app and if you've got you know i think i forget how much it costs like 2.99 maybe um on the ipad um i think the full version for your recording is 20 dollars. it is worth every goddamn penny and it's a um so what it is it's supposed to replicate kind of those ostentatious ostentatious saxophone sounds of you know the 70s and the 80s you know you think of like again yacht rock you think of huey lewis in the news uh eddie money any of these um you know pop rock songs from that time period that have these really over the top saxophone solos they get made fun of all the time and uh in the middle of it you know i mean with virtual instruments it's really hard to get a very authentic sounding instrument obviously um but this one has a knob in the middle of it it's only a one knob on the on the app and it's the sex knob or if you use the pg version it's the love knob and when you turn the sex knob up it adds some reverb it adds a little vibrato it makes it even more over the top and i just lost myself having fun playing with this app with this app on my my phone and my ipad and, you know, I got the program version so I could record it on the track. But um, it just screamed to me the Yacht Rock that I needed um, to, to just give Logan Seam that extra, that extra push. And at the very first Capital event, so you got to remember, this is, nobody knows Capital yet. Nobody knows the wrestlers. 
So, or I mean, they may know them from the local New York scene, but some of the wrestlers, like Logan's from, we run in New Jersey, and Logan's from Virginia. So I'm not sure how how often he was up in our area before. So I'm in the front row watching the watching the event, and the music kicks in, and he comes to the ring, and he's got that smarmy look to him he's got his sweater tied around his neck you know the crowd is booing the crap out of him and behind me someone goes hey i don't know who you are but your music sucks and you would think i would be offended by that but i wasn't because i was like that is the highest compliment because in wrestling whether you're a good guy or you're a bad guy you either want to you want to elicit a a response from the crowd. Oh, sorry, started that uh, early. But um, you want to elicit a response from the crowd. You want them to cheer you or you want them to boo you. And to have Logan, you know, come out and immediately get that, have the music immediately turn the crowd against him in that the way that it needs to was just one of the most perfect feelings that I've, I've had. So, anyway, here is the theme song for Logan Easton LaRoe.
I hope you enjoyed the the little niece and Laro theme. Again, super over the top, I know. Um, but okay, let's move on. Uh, so the next theme I wanted to present to you, uh, I've only got a couple more themes I want to uh, share with you guys. Uh, the next one I want to share with you is, uh, originally it was for the character Matt Sex Sells. Sorry, the rock and roll model Matt Sex Sells. Um, but has since become the, the song for the tag team that he has with um, Smiley, who's a masked luchador. And um, so uh, when they were... Uh, this is, you know, at the before the very first show, and I was talking to them about the characters I want they wanted me to write for. Matt Sex Sells was one that immediately I was like, all right, I know what's going on here, because his whole thing, he's a rock and roll model. You know, you look at pictures of him dressed like a an '80s rock guy and um, you know, leopard um, or zebra print um, neon tights, and he's got long blonde hair and he's drinking beer and he's you know, he's got a Metallica tattoo on his chest. It's like, you know, I'm like, okay, I, I can do this. You know, this guy is straight out of my time. You know, the 80s metal, which I love so much, hair metal. Um, but I didn't want to go full hair metal. You know, um, I wanted to at least, I wanted the song to have a little bit of an edge. And so I started thinking about songs from that time period that don't aren't just your normal kind of hair metal anthems. And so I thought of, oh, uh, there's Mr. Scary by Dokken. Dokken, everybody remembers as kind of a hair metal band, but Mr. Scary was George Lynch's uh, instrumental tour de force. And so I kind of went off of that and, and also, you know, thought about other, you know, uh, it falls under the realm of traditional metal, I guess. But, you know, I wanted something that, recalled the 80s but was not necessarily you know drenched in aerosol so to speak um because i wanted it to be fun and um i wanted it to emphasize the characters but at the same time i didn't want them to be a joke i didn't i wasn't going for steel panther you know i wanted it to you know be taken seriously as kind of a really cool instrumental metal track and so that, you know, I thought about, you know, I, I was thinking about Black Sabbath and Iron Maiden and other tra uh, Wasp, um, Metallica, you know, all that kind of stuff. I wanted to add that kind of vibe to with a little bit of hair metal mixed in, a little bit of Dokken, um, and what I got was what you're about to hear which is, and, and originally the song was going to have lyrics. And I thought, okay, well, his name is Matt Sex Sells. And he's coming in as kind of a, for those of you who don't know him, he is kind of a goofy character. Um, he has a web series called It's Never Sunny in Matt Lanza, which is basically a self-deprecating look at his life, um, you know, kind of amped up for the series. So he's he's the kind of guy who likes to joke around. He doesn't take himself super seriously in terms of his character in, in certain times. Um, but when he gets in that ring, he's all business. But um, so I wanted to kind of play off that. So I came up with the title. Well, why don't we call it Sex Sells, But Who's Buying? But then I was like, well, that's not goofy enough. So then I was like, okay, um you know, or, or, and then, or actually, no, I'm sorry. I thought that was pretty goofy, but then they're like, well, why don't you do sex sells and I'm buying or something like that? You know, uh, again, you know, it's playing off the Megadeth title. Um, but I ended up going with sex sells, but who's buying, uh, just, you know, for the fun of it. And it's a fun track. And, um, again, at the, at the very first Capitol show, um, when he was on his way back, to the dressing room after after his match he kind of you know came up to me and he said hey man thank you and again you know that's it's just kind of cool to know that you know i, I might be you know pumping my own tires here but you know it just it made me feel pretty good that i'm able to write music that people are responding to and you know with when you're doing original music that's a hard thing to do um 
and it takes time and you have to build an audience. Um, but you know, it's just really cool to get that kind of instant gratification that the person I wrote this song for appreciated it enough that he, you know, wanted to let me know. So anyway, here is Sex Sells, but who's buying? All right. Hope you enjoyed that. Uh, I'm realizing I say all right after almost every one of these themes. I should be a radio DJ, an 80s rock radio DJ. All right. Um, Okay. So now I wanted to move on to probably one of the hardest themes, um, aside from Mike Law's theme, and that was for the character of Sonny Kiss. Sonny Kiss is, for lack of a better way of explaining it so i'm going to use wrestling terminology he is the top baby face in our company baby face meaning good guy um and sunny kiss came in with you know this kind of you know he the uh, marcus matt had this very specific trajectory they wanted for his character a very certain story they wanted to tell and it was going to culminate with him, you know, overcoming extreme odds, 
to win his first match in Capital at the third show. And because um, he's from Jersey City, we we ran in Jersey City initially until we ran into some logistical problems with the venue. And now we're running in Hoboken. But still, Hoboken and Jersey City, they're right next to each other. So uh, Sonny is our hometown hero. And um, he was getting a really good response because he was bringing friends and family to the crowd, people who wanted to see him wrestle. And, you know, so we purposely, uh, or he purposely, you know, was scripted to lose at the first couple ones. And it was all to build up to this third one where he finally overcame adversity, won, and established himself as the top babyface in our uh, federation. So, apparently my doorbell rang. My dog is going crazy. But, you know, I'm recording a podcast, so... Sorry. I'm not going to answer the door right now. Anyway, so, uh, Sunny Kiss, um, you know, he came out to different music for his first couple appearances, but, uh, hold on a second. All right, so sorry about that, uh, technical difficulties, well, interruption difficulties, uh, as you probably heard a couple seconds ago, my doorbell started ringing, and my dog, Bowie, went crazy. And then I saw some shadows of some, I thought my wife was home and there was some noise and it was distracting me. And so I just had to stop it for a second just while I uh, dealt with that. And right now Bowie is by my side. I think he's a little, a little annoyed that somebody came by and ruined his peacefulness. <laughs> Excuse me. Anyway, so, or where was I? Okay, Sunny Kiss. So yeah, like I said, Sonny Kiss established himself as uh, the top babyface, top good guy in our company. And after the second Capital Wrestling event where he had been using different music, uh, Marcus and I were talking, we were having breakfast, and Marcus made it very clear that Sonny needed his own music and it needed to be something big. It needed to be something special. And um, so uh, task with that i spoke with sunny and we kind of came up with different ideas um and and really what ended up happening was we wanted to come up with something very poppy um almost kind of dance danceable like dance music and um you know it started off as kind of a like a pop rock song kind of in the vein of um oh, i forget the name of the the person who I was, I was kind of using as a template, but um, it, it was, you know, kind of a fast, kind of almost pop punk feel um, with, it was, it was supposed to have kind of cutesy, I guess, is for lack of a better word, um, female vocals on it and have like kind of over the top synthesizers and be kind of like a synthy pop anthem. Um, when I sent the demo to Sonny, he wanted something a little bit less rock more dance so um at that point i had recorded some vocals with um, shannon uh, shannon kelly who is a singer who uh, was singing in ballast at um before we went on hiatus and um so uh over the last couple months a uh, few months now actually uh shannon and i worked on it and you know the the theme you know we got her to you know we figured out the, the right way to sing it. You know, Shannon originally was going for kind of a Pat Benatar vibe, but then we're like, well, we got to go a little bit more pop, a little bit more like um, Jessica Simpson or Britney Spears, for lack of a better term. And it's so funny to me to have a metalhead like myself trying to write a pop song. And it's surprising how easy certain elements of it came together. In terms of, you know, immediately I wrote a first verse, I wrote a chorus, um, playing around with synthesizers is just so much fun. And believe it or not, I actually really enjoy listening to pop music. Um, I don't take it the same way that I take, you know, serious music that I listen to, you know, I, but, uh, but, you know, I love it. If I need something mindless and fun, you know, I'll go with it. Um, or if I want something a little bit 
little more depth, you know, I'll, I'll put on some '80s pop music, you know, something that has a little better, a little better musical performance and everything. But you know, I love working with synthesizers and doing this kind of fun stuff. So it was a lot of fun putting this together, and you know, we crafted what I think is a really amazing pop dance song. And so this song is called Forever United and is Sunny Kiss's theme. Enjoy. Let's get Sunny Licious. you think of that track probably something different than you would have thought you would have heard from me right um uh, well now let's go from that so the last song i'm going to play for you is one that probably makes a lot more sense with um what i've done um and this was for a character named paul jordan the end game so it feels fitting to end this podcast with the end games music and Paul Jordan is a super tall, uh, muscled out dude um, who goes into the ring and destroys his opponents. <laughs> so around the same time that I was talking to Marcus about Sonny Kiss's music, we talked about Paul Jordan's and Marcus was like, you know, I want the sound of the apocalypse. That's all the, the direction I was given for this one. So... I kind of came up with a doomy sounding guitar riff. Um, 
you know, with my guitar tuned down to B. And then, you know, with a lot of these wrestling themes, um, there has to be some kind of connection, some kind of um, something that I can tie it back to in terms of, like, you know, for Mike Law, I had this really big vision of what, um, you know, a, a kind of a promotional video could look like for Mike to, you know, showcase him. Um, for Sonny, it was, it was more the vibe and like, again, like, you know, I could see the visuals for it. Um, so for Paul, his theme needed to be something, oh, again, over the top. It needed to be something that frankly hadn't been done in wrestling, I don't think. And, you know, originally I wasn't even going to have guitar parts in it. I was just going to have a bunch of, uh, ap apocalyptic sounds. Um, but you know, it, it made sense to me afterwards to kind of come up with a guitar riff that kind of centers you, but I wanted to have kind of an overarching theme. So me being the Catholic, you know, my Catholic school upbringing, I decided to reference the book of revelations and, you know, the passage about the seven trumpets. And so of course, you know, I, I went back to, um, I'm sure some of you have seen these videos of this phenomenon where people are just kind of in their streets or whatever. And, you know, you in their house or walking around and you hear this weird, like, it's not a trumpet sound like you would normally think. It's like this low, um, like horror movie sounding trumpet or horn sound. And it scares the crap out of people every time it happens. And so that's what I wanted. I wanted to create that. And so it, it was kind of, um, it, 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 I won't lie, it wasn't the easiest thing in the world. But I basically just started stacking notes, uh, some that were kind of discordant with the other ones. And I started uh, going into my library of virtual instruments and just kind of grabbing any kind of you know, horn, like, um, I think there's a trombone in there, there's a tuba, there's a, a bassoon, sorry, that's not a horn, that's a woodwind, but, you know, any kind of low sound, and then give it a little bit of dissonance, a little bit of reverb, create it, and you've got this epic sounding trumpet, well, you know, almost apocalyptic trumpet, and you have the sound of my guitar and you know i needed seven trumpet blasts so uh, as you can tell there will be seven times the trumpet sounds so in between that i had to fill the, the gaps so the guitar takes up certain parts of it there's some drums but then i just started going crazy and finding sounds of war sounds of explosions sounds of gunshots um, i got the sound of a tornado siren um, I got the sound of some thunderstorms. Um, I sampled the, the really noisy metal gate at my, at Concilium's rehearsal space and used it to kind of sound like a gate opening up and, you know, I don't know, the gate of hell, you know, <laughs> and something coming out because it's the apocalypse, man. It's gotta be scary. And, you know, at the, at the, and it's not. It's, it's interesting that I kind of put this after playing the Sunny Kiss for you, Sunny Kiss theme for you, because at the last Capitol show, uh, Sunny Kiss went up against the End Game, Paul Jordan, and that was his big victory, which propelled him to the next step in his story arc. And um, and so before that show, I was talking to Paul, and. You know, spoiler alert, Paul Jordan is one of the nicest guys ever. But uh, sorry if that ruins the, the mystique, Paul. But, uh, but you know, I talked to him ahead of time. And, and again, he was really thankful for the music. He really enjoyed it. And, you know, he, you know, he knew where I was coming from and knew what we were trying to accomplish. And I just kind of gave him a little bit, you know, I, I, I can't tell a wrestler what to do. I don't know what to tell them to do in the ring. I can't, you know, that's not my job. But with him, I took him aside. And I said, look, man, th 
this song is meant for one thing. I want you to go out there and I want you to scare the shit out of any children in that audience. And I know that sounds terrible, but I grew up where The Undertaker debuted at Survivor Series 1990, and me, being 12 years old, was scared to shit of him. And that's what I wanted Paul Jourdain to do. I wanted him to be this larger-than-life bad guy. I wanted him, I wanted people to be scared of him. Apparently, Bowie wants to be on the podcast, too. Bowie, I'm recording. Well, anyway. Anyway, so, Bowie, come here. Y'all just got a peek into my life, recording in my dining room with my dog going crazy. So, anyway, to end off... <laughs> to end this podcast, thank you for sticking with me as I, as I took you on a journey through the music of Capital Wrestling. Here is the music for the endgame, Paul Jourdain. Mm-hmm.